Um, did you notice when uh, Mr. Drake did a little, little chop? He was chopping wood, right, there for a second. On what beat? Beat four. Yeah. What did I do? And I mentioned that name, the Charleston rhythm. It's sort of something they, you know, they use as, a, as an explanation. But it has, it has a rhythmic hookup. So and show them how that interacts. Play, one, play your rhythm two, first. Three, four. One in the end of two. One and two. Mr. Red Garland, great pianist, right? Used a lot of this. Yeah, with and I'll be one and three. similar tempo and everything, but I want Leo to be soloing, and I want you to talk to them as you're showing them what you're doing, okay? okay. So over the top of the music, just he'll demonstrate different things from not playing at all to, because he was doing so many different things just now, it's easy for it to all just kind of like, like, well, that was great, whatever all that was. <laughs> um, if it sounds yeah. easy, it doesn't, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and. He mentioned practicing with a metronome. I would say one additional thing. Practicing with great recordings, too. Yes. Play along with recordings. Yeah. You'll absorb, now, all kinds of recordings. You'll hear various ways that time goes. Sometimes things are not metronomically accurate. In some of the greatest jazz, legendary jazz recordings, it's not always metronomically perfect. Um, depending on the conditions, depending on the attitude, depending on how much weed they smoked, who knows. But there could be all kinds of renderings of the time. It's still an important influence, but also play along with recordings that were done to a click track. Do do play along with music that's metronomically solid, because you'll be called on to do it. Try playing with a click track the first time in the studio, and you play. Wow, I thought I had good time. Um, or try doing a show for a long period of time that's click. Or Mike has done thousands of those. Um, so. So in addition to metronome, play with recordings and then play with play with uh, stuff that was done with a click. Um, but anyway, so uh, on to demonstration. Let's do uh, Wine and Roses and start with you talk, I'm talking through the various approaches to comping that you were just doing. So You don't mind if I speak in Swedish, do you? No. <laughs> you want to be comfortable. <laughs> Well, you'll have subtitles. I later. want to keep my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do a slightly brighter tempo, too, before we're at it. One. Two, one, two, three. anyone couldn't hear over the top of the music just talk about those two different things you were doing well for me different. for me comping right maybe other people have different ideas about it but I think as a general rule we play on a tune right in this case they so on roses so and I know a lot of drummers their left hand on the snare um, they accent when the melody is not present in the holes, right, in the, in the spaces. So that's that's a good go-to kind of a thing for both guitar players and piano players. So I was I'm singing the melody, and and any time I play, I don't I try not to lose the melody because I feel like if I lose the melody, well, I lose you know the sense of form and phrasing and everything, right? So you got to keep that melody with you, and and I trust. Uh, and at the same time, though, I have a peripheral kind of a hearing going on, right? I'm listening to Leo, so I'm not completely just doing my thing, not paying attention to what he's doing. But I feel like 
I'm doing, I'm starting something, I take the initiative of comping a certain way. Off, if I comp off the melody in the spaces, see, will that, it, it's that a good thing right now? It's, show, show them what that literally sounds like. So okay. I'll play the melody and you, so they right. have it in their heads, and you play the, um, the comping approach in the gaps in the melody. He's right. talking about the pre-existing melody gaps, okay? Not the gaps in his solo, okay? So one, two, one, two, three. As a way of structuring his comping, and we wonder why it works so well. It's amazing. So, so that's cool. Then the other approach you were taking. Well, I was like a one, two, four, one, two, three, four. One. So I leave two bars rest, Big right? Fat but, but holes. One, two, three, four. But now that approach to me is like, well, I want Leo. I want to give Leo a little bit more space. So he doesn't feel like I'm, um, you know, just chugging down voicings or whatever, rhythmic ideas into his, right, music making. So that's just sort of a, a you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to be, a, you know, a team player here. And, and he, when he does that, by the way, <laughs> it has the exact same musical impact on the overall group as a brass section in a big band. Literally, they're not playing all the time. So when they do play, pop, it's something, you know? And it has a huge impact, the gaps between them. And then the busier it gets, of course, the more intense, but, but if it's just in your face all the time, then it loses its momentum, right? It loses its impact. So I, those little punctuated things are really great. As far as rhythmic ideas for, for myself that I have gained so much from are from listening to the bassy, the Count Basie big band and the Thad, Thad Jones big band. Thad Jones has a little bit more like, he sneaks in rhythmic ideas a little bit more on different kind of like places within the time frame, right? Basie can be a little bit more like Call, I'll say what I let the people generally call with. Okay, what are you going to Okay, and then I'll tell him what it is. And he goes, Is this like 32 bar tune? You know, he'll ask me what's the form of the tune if he doesn't know it. And I've even seen him look it up on his iPhone. So that's incredibly important. It's not a beat <laughs> that he's about to play, it's a tune. So just keep that in mind. And then, of course, you're just trying to take tunes home and learn them and absorb them deeply. This is as crucial for the drums as anybody in the band. And so he's already figured that out. And he thinks, what can I do to play the tune? Not just play a swing groove that I think I hear where we're going. So keep that in mind. Okay, so um, I guess maybe just to illustrate something along this lines with ensemble thinking or whatever. Stefan, would you grab your horn? For a minute? Okay. We got two Stefans in the same space here. So let's think about the drum kit and the orchestration possibilities there, not in a wide way, but maybe just at this basic level, it's easy to get past people. Out of his, out of all the pieces of the kit that he has <laughs> today, which one of them most closely resembles what I'm doing? It's rather abstract, but think about it. If we're playing swing-oriented music, which part of his kit? The Perhaps swing. Well, right symbol. Yeah, the right symbol. Now he is probably feathering a lot of the quarter notes, so he's probably playing the bass drum pretty lightly on a lot of the quarter notes. 
But if you really boil it all down, play just your ride symbol for a second. One, two, one, two, three. not exclusively, but most closely resembles what the piano comping is doing. The snare, right, right. So now, just snare and ride cymbal. Same tune, and now you comp a little bit, Stefan. Comp a little bit. One, two, one, two, three. Maybe all that's really all what a lot of it is. It's just knowing what parts correspond to what. It was eye-opening the first time someone pointed that out to me. That's why I may be saying the obvious to some of you, but that wasn't obvious to me at first. I didn't know all that. And all of a sudden, I figured that out. I'm going, oh, well, that's where my ear can go. I'm trying to groove with the drummer. Listen there. That's this. And now, boom. When you, did you hear him move the harmony up kind of chromatically? Okay. But if he had, and he already set that in motion for himself, like he spawned that idea for himself. He took a lick that he played and then he just moved it up chromatically. But I bet you anything, and it was the last two bars of the tune, it almost felt to me like quickly cram this in, cram this in. If you hadn't played anything, they would have played something even hipper. That would have, bam, you would have just launched into the next chorus. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, that's contrived for me to say that because it was perfectly fine. But I'm just telling you, make, and especially in this kind of an atmosphere of tune, make the rhythm section even more a part of your soul. And even more amazing things will happen with the phrasing. Okay? So, so play a full chorus, and I want you just, just to, as a technique to try this, deliberately leave the last two bars of the chorus open. Okay. Okay? Just like on purpose. Uh, Telling everybody. Okay? <laughs> it better work. <laughs> okay? One, two, one, two, three. <laughs> just gonna like like if you're ever sitting in you'd probably notice if you go to that jam session I'm not gonna throw you to the wolves if if it's not like in your comfort zone but someone like him I, he can handle that a little bit so we're gonna try some things out you know 
So anyway, don't you ever just suddenly just try something like, gee, I wonder. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes you know, also you think about when you have a modal tone, it's like a C minor kind of thing, or you have a scale. If we, if we one bar of each scale note, go go up the scale. Mm. As an example, one, two, one, two, three, four. things that we how about going backwards go down instead so sometimes a very conscious little hmm I wonder maybe you don't try it on the bandstand at first maybe you try it in a rehearsal or whatever with your best buddy you know but that's how you learn like just what it is and then nine times out of ten you'll do it you go, oh that was so hip and you go wait a minute yeah Herbie did that <laughs> 25 50 years ago you know so you're probably not reinventing the wheel. And then, just in terms of the rhythmic uh, vocabulary that that was, that's a very different approach, right? It's not dance-oriented. It still has to have a time, but um, sometimes in that approach, I, I, th I try to think of what would be the impact of me not walking so that I'm functioning almost like Stefan's left hand, you know? I'm with his left hand and I'm just So if I play anything rhythmic, it needs to be in the pocket and my downbeats need to be solid about every two bars or so. That opens it up for you, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. So let's just do that for a second. Just rhythm section. One, two, one, two, one, two, three. Some more. Um, I was mentioning last last Saturday about what it is to be melodic, uh, what melodic sense is, and what, the way I was trying to phrase it is that all of us are influenced by all the melodies we've ever heard, from the simplest Mary Had a Little Lamb to Debbie C and everything in between. But that needs to be a more definitive influence by you studying great melodies. And I guess just to summarize what I was maybe sort of poorly illustrating for you last time is what I kind of condensed down to think about what makes great melodies really is two things. All great melodies in some way or other utilize something like a sequence, sequential progression, a development of an idea across further material, and a sense of resolution. So if you would just listen to this one little passage, hopefully after all this couple hours worth I can play this, but this is a little excerpt of one of the Bach cello suites. And just listen to what Bach does right here. Exactly the same shape that someone like Charlie Parker would use for playing on the dominant seventh flat nine. Right? So it's no accident that Charlie Parker would, maybe by accident, maybe consciously, <clears throat> be influenced by that sense of sequence that you see all over the place in Bach. And then notice the sense of resolution. Not only, I don't mean just resolution like, whoo, he finally got home. I mean that it goes here. That arpeggio is the tonic 
chord G minor. Then he drops a seven back to the same note where he was. So he doesn't forget the B flat that he got up to. And so you hear the sense of resolution, which really winds up boiling down to three blind mice and D of G minor. By the way, Michael Heatley here. This is, you may or may not realize this if you're not a bass player, but it's incredibly difficult to play anybody else's bass. <laughs> um, and then much less to come in and play on a rapid tempo tune, you know, in front of everybody like that. So I got my hat goes off to you. Um, I would say my hair, but it's already gone. Um, so why don't we pick a, uh, maybe a slightly more uh, relaxed tempo, but any tune you guys feel like. There's no greater love. Okay. No greater love? Okay. Cool. So when this is when this happens and you're calling up a tune, you'll notice uh, that there needs to be an agreement about how we're starting this thing. The most typical common themes, common intros, if you will, are either play the last A section of the tune or play a turnaround progression, one six two five, three six two five in the key you're in or a five pedal, or some will say just start right on it, meaning right on the melody, okay? Uh, but this tune has melody pickups, so I think it's cool to, to put an intro in front of it. So let's just for grins, let's do a turnaround and B flat, and then give him a nice little pickup measure, okay? So bar eight, kind of leave a little space for that. One, two, one, two, five. satisfied will you be if we get to the end of the seven minutes or so that that would have been and it never gets any more intense than that not at all okay what will you do to make that not be where that stays um, I'd probably at the top of the next form play a press roll um, start digging into the right a bit more okay um, that's it's too late, too late. Right. you should already be going a little bit you're still whispering 
Like, if I didn't know what you were doing was sort of technically right, because it was the right style and the time was decent, it was the right, you were doing a nice concept, but it was so darn polite, I was like, mm hmm. Is there a drummer? Oh, yes, he's sort of playing something. Right, Mike? Okay. So, so what happened, Andre, is this. You started that tune on the with the brushes on the right. Yeah. So there was already no definition going on. Okay. Okay. It's really difficult to play brushes on a ride and get definition to a, a band. So yes, by all means, we all start with brushes. On the snare, to give definition, guys, this is where it's at and I've got it. Alright, get in their face with it. Okay? It's not a rock tune, obviously we're not approaching you know what I mean though, yeah. right? becomes a definition. And then when, when I got to the ride and the solo, I was waiting for you to dig in and John picked up on it as well. And it became frustrating to listen to because we know what it's supposed to be doing at that point. Dig in. Um, give me a stick please. All right. Who's played this? You're right, Stefan. Two. One and two solo. <laughs> Thank you. 